I'm uh, Walter Willett, and I'm chair of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health. Our work is very broadly examining how what we eat influences our long-term risk of health and disease. Uh, we're interested, for example, in types of fat in relation to cardiovascular disease and cancer, fruits and vegetables in relation to many different endpoints, and uh, one of our uh, complex areas of research right at the moment is looking at dairy products and the different constituents of dairy products in relation to cancers, cardiovascular disease, and fractures. Uh, there are a lot of areas that are really uh, interesting from a research standpoint and have the potential to have major impacts on our health. Uh, one is vitamin D. Uh, I think probably most people have seen about uh, vitamin D in the news and uh, this is really exciting because not more than a few years ago we thought that vitamin D was only related to bone health and prevention of osteoporosis and fractures. But now we know that there are vitamin D receptors in almost every organ of the body and it looks like vitamin D is playing a critical role in many different functions including our immune system. Uh, including the regulation of cell multiplication, so that's likely related to cancer, uh, and probably in relation to degenerative conditions like multiple sclerosis. Uh, the evidence is now really very strong that uh, high, most Americans have inadequate levels of vitamin D, and increasing that, the levels would reduce the risk of colon cancer and probably other cancers as well. So uh, knowing uh, the final results on all of the benefits of higher vitamin D is going to take a few years, but I think at this time there's enough evidence for uh, colon cancer prevention, for prevention of osteoporosis and falls in elderly people that it's, uh, it makes sense for us, almost all of us to be taking vitamin D supplements unless we're really out in the sun a lot. Another very important topic that's related a little bit is uh, the role of calcium and dairy products in nutrition and health. And there has been, of course, a recommendation that we should be consuming three servings of dairy products a day. That's actually a very radical recommendation because it would, be, it would about double the dairy product consumption in the United States if everyone followed that guideline. And it's also very radical if we look over time and history. In fact, if we look around the world, the vast majority of adults do not consume dairy products uh, on a regular basis at all. And it had been thought that, well, um, even if there's not much benefit from all that dairy consumption, it's not harmful. But as we've started to look into this in more detail, the evidence is now strong that high dairy consumption will increase the risk of fatal prostate cancer and very possibly ovarian cancer as well. So this is a, a lot of research in progress. I think at the moment it's uh, probably wise to consume dairy products, you know, maybe one or two servings a day, if at all. Uh, but clearly there's a lot of uh, very interesting research that's still to emerge. Food that uh, is fed to the cows also will make a difference uh, in the nu nutritional content. Uh, for example, uh, grass-fed cows will have fatty acid content in their milk that's different than grain-fed cows. Now, how big a difference that is, how important that difference is, I think we actually don't know at this time. These various feeding and management practices do uh, really affect the nature of the milk that we're consuming. So what we call milk today is not what milk was 50 or 100 years ago. And uh, that's likely to have important health implications, but we can't be sure about uh, what they are at this point in time yet. Well, I think it's almost impossible, in fact misleading, to, tie, to try to generalize about what Americans are eating uh, and where they're headed, and including what is their particular dietary attraction at the moment. Uh, there's so much variety and heterogeneity in the American public that the average is almost meaningless. It applies to almost nobody. Uh, my general view is that Americans are going in two different directions. Uh, in their eating habits. Uh, one is a direction of uh, major health consciousness. People who are concerned about their health and well-being and want to make healthy choices. In fact, will go out of their way to find healthier food choices and pay more for them. And for example, 
Uh, that is the part of the population that years ago gave up smoking, is uh, exercising, pay, paying attention to their weight, and they are very concerned about what they eat. And they'll uh, shop at Whole Foods, pay a lot more, and that is a growing part of the population. The biggest part of the growth uh, in the food uh, retail business is the whole food healthy type of, uh, of the market. But that still is a minority. And the sad reality is that there's a very large part of the population that is uh, eating probably worse than ever, uh, is eating uh, more fast, unhealthy fast food, uh, drinking more soda, and gaining huge amounts of weight and experiencing uh, increases in diabetes and the complications of diabetes. So it's, uh, we are re really becoming two worlds, uh, not just economically, but nutritionally and health-wise as well. But if I look at where I'd like to see diets headed, uh, it's really uh, more related to the processing of the uh, ingredients that are already in the food supply. Another area where uh, Americans are severely off target is carbohydrate quality. In fact, I would think that's now after trans fats are getting under control, the biggest nutritional problem, meaning high glycemic index carbohydrates that are stripped of fiber and the other nutritional attributes that they would have in the whole grain form. So uh, on the menus, more tasty, well-produced whole grain breads, good, tasty, attractive whole grain pastas, interesting ways of preparing brown rice. Uh, all of that's very possible and you can have wonderful, interesting, tasty, uh, and healthy meals with whole grains. I, I think that's a big challenge for uh, retailers, restaurants, and everybody in the food supply. I think the other really big challenge facing the U.S. food supply is to eliminate or almost eliminate sugary beverages. Uh, that Sugary beverages are a particularly severe problem. It's way too easy to overconsume those sources of calories, and those calories are have nothing but negative effects. They increase the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and, and so on. And the amount of uh, sugary beverages in the food supply is, is really huge. So uh, coming up with alternatives, uh, of course the ideal is pure water, but I think it's important to have a, a variety of alternatives for different people at different times. So having products that are either no sugar and not full of artificial sweeteners, uh, or maybe reduced sugar, say something like one gram per ounce of beverage uh, that are attractive. And those are very possible. There are a few products on the food supply that meet that. More recently, there's been a lot of hype about high fructose corn sweetener. So I've seen some people, actually some beverage companies, saying they're switching from high fructose corn sweetener to regular sugar. Uh, th that won't do anything. High fructose corn sweetener uh, should not re be regarded as different than regular table sugar, and we eat far too much of both of them. Sort of put them in the same pot and cut that pot by about three quarters is what we need to do. That uh, regular table sugar is 50% fructose and 50% glucose. Uh, high fructose corn sweetener is 55% fructose, and most of the rest is glucose. So there's really only a very slight different difference in their actual composition and metabolically they're uh, virtually identical. Well, I think the relation between diet and brain health, and that might be represented by prevention of Alzheimer's disease or cognitive decline, is really one of the big frontiers in nutrition. It's one of the hardest things to study because by the time someone is affected, you don't really believe what they tell you uh, about their eating habits anyway. So we have to look at this in long-term prospective studies. And I think there are some exciting things there. We're starting to have some results from long-term studies. One of the most interesting and important findings was that in the physician's health study, where men were randomized to beta carotene pills or placebo, uh, after 12 years there was no difference, but after 18 years there was better cognitive function in the men on the beta carotene pills. And that, I'm not uh, suggesting that everybody run out for beta carotene pills, but it's important in several ways. It's really the first direct evidence that an antioxidant, specifically here beta carotene, can uh, reduce decline in cognitive function or help prevent uh, dementia. And secondly, that it, really long-term studies are necessary. At 12 years there was no benefit, but it took 18 years 
a follow-up to see the benefit. So most of the studies that have been done so far are just uh, very, too, very much too limited in duration to expect to see anything. We really have to invest in long-term studies. Uh, but here's a, an important uh, clue that what we eat can make an important difference. There's some additional evidence uh, uh, from non-randomized trials that more fruits and vegetables may be better. And the types of fat that prevent heart disease are also related to better cognitive function. So, in fact, it's interesting that much of what we see about diet and preventing heart disease is also turning out to be related to cognitive function in the long run. Yes, yeah, so there does seem to be a lot in common with nutritional factors that prevent uh, heart disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, and now more recently evidence that those will also affect cognitive function. And, and it's not too surprising. A lot of the same metabolic processes apply to diabetes and heart disease. And we're also learning that a lot of uh, cognitive function or brain health is related to the blood vessels that supply the, the brain. So keeping those vessels in good health through diet, nutrition, and activity is turning out to be very important to preventing uh, dementia over the long run. Now, probably one of the biggest myths was not just in the general public, it was really the belief within the nutrition community that fat in the diet was the major cause of ill health in the American population. Uh, it was thought that fat was the major cause of breast cancer, colon cancer, cardiovascular disease, and reduction in fat intake was the number one advice that was given to most Americans, and for that matter, people around the world. But as the data have come in, We've just not seen that the percentage of calories from fat is related to anything important. The type of fat is extremely important. Trans fat and saturated fat have adverse effects, but unsaturated fats, fats actually reduce blood cholesterol, prevent heart disease, diabetes, and uh, other conditions. The biggest mistake, I think, was enthusiasm over low-fat products because uh, many of those low-fat products were really uh, just sugar replacing fat and sometimes these products were worse than the original version. Uh, one of the most egregious examples was uh, fat-free salad dressings. When the fat in salad dressings is the good type of fat, it's the type of fat you should be eating. It helps absorb the micronutrients in the salad and it makes you eat more fruits and vegetables because they taste better uh, if you've got real fat salad dressing on them. So, some of these low-fat products were a mistake. Uh, the food guide pyramid that was launched in 1992 and was essentially enforced until 2005 had as its primary message that all fat is bad. Uh, that and other aspects of the pyramid became clearly outdated and in 2005 the Department of Agriculture released a new food guide pyramid. But that's actually a joke. Uh, given that the U.S. food guide pyramid uh, was either misleading or not helpful at all, we thought it would be a good idea to come out with a, a pyramid that was based on the best scientific evidence. Uh, without going into a great detail, our pyramid does emphasize healthy forms of carbohydrate, meaning whole grain, high fiber uh, products, uh, healthy forms of fat, which are the, from almost all the liquid vegetable oils, and then de-emphasizes uh, uh, unhealthy fats, uh, trans fat in particular, but low amounts of red meat and butter, and then very importantly, uh, it puts in the use sparingly group things like white rice, white pasta, uh, white bread, other baked products, uh, soda, sugary sweets. Uh, those actually add up to about 40% of the calories in the American diet and uh, increase risk of heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. So that's actually, I think, at this point in time, the biggest problem in the American diet. Uh, what we do know about nutrition is that it's uh, important to have balance and variety. In some ways, I, I, and I, it's analogous to uh, an orchestra. You need all the instruments there and you need them in balance for uh, good music and for good health.